So I want to uh, talk to you this morning about the praying church, the praying church. And a fisherman uh, was at sea with his godless companions when a storm came up and threatened to sink their ship. His friends begged him to pray, but he said, it's been a long time since I've done that or even entered a church. At their insistence, however, he finally cried out, O oh Lord, I haven't asked anything of you in 15 years. And if you help us now and bring us safely to land, I promise I won't bother you again for another 15 years. You know, I, I know that's uh, supposed to be somewhat of a funny story, but uh, really it's kind of a sad story because I think this story is like many people's prayer life. We pray sporadically, occasionally, hit and miss, and only when we are in deep trouble. And uh, God wants us to be a people that are devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. In Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2, the scripture says this. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And so we are either devoted to prayer or we are devoid of prayer. And this morning I want to talk to you about a church that devotes itself to prayer. And our text for this is found in Acts chapter 12, verse number 5 through 17. But before we get to that text, let me just talk to you a little bit. What does it mean to be devoted in prayer? It means that we pray often and we pray regular. It's not infrequent or a hit and miss. It means that you take steps to see that it is a regular part of your life the same way that eating and sleeping are. How many are devoted to eating? <laughs> How many are devoted to sleeping? Amen. Well, then we need to be devoted to prayer. So whether it, the Bible calls it being devoted to prayer or to continue in prayer or to persevere in prayer, it occurs throughout the book of Acts by the early church because the early church was a praying church. Let me share some examples of prayer by the early church found in the book of Acts. First of all, Acts chapter 1, verse number 14. Uh, this is after Jesus' ascension. Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and then that they were to wait. So the first line of obedience that the disciples obeyed Jesus' command was a command to go and wait and to pray. Acts 1.14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1 and 2, it is also a time when they devoted themselves to pray. Uh, it was when the Pentecostal outpouring came upon the church that as they gathered to pray, God poured out His Spirit upon them. You know what? Prayer is the time when we receive from the Lord, that the Lord wants to descend upon us and, and receive from Him. You know, when Jesus was in, the, in being baptized, and as He was praying, he, the Bible says, as He was praying, it said the Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. You know, it's times when we gather for worship or times that when we go to pray that God wants to descend upon us and pour out His Spirit upon us. And as we gather here, my prayer is that we have an outpouring of God's Spirit upon us as we gather in His name as we seek Him in prayer and worship. We see in Acts chapter 2, it says there, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. We also see in the same chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse number 42, it says, it tells us of how the church devoted themselves to prayer. 
It says, as the early church began to grow, as the church was growing, they commit themselves to some disciplines. It says in Acts 2.42, they devoted, there's that word, they continued, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of crawfish, and to prayer. <laughs> Heresy. But how many of you see that there were several disciplines that the church committed as they, as they were growing, and one of those disciplines was the discipline of praying. How many of you know the early church was a praying church? Acts chapter 6, you can also see that the leaders get so... Um, the leaders get so preoccupied with doing stuff that they, they said, you know what, we've got to commit ourselves to, to the ministry of the word and to prayer because so much stuff could have came and preoccupied their time. They knew the important role that prayer played in the, the role of a leader's life. And look at this, Acts chapter 6 verse 4, it says, but we... The disciples, the, 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 the early leaders will give ourselves continually, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. How many of you know it's important for leaders to commit themselves to be people of prayer? And so the early church devoted themselves to prayer and their leaders as well. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 31. We know that after the uh, church experienced persecution, uh, the church faced uh, some intense persecution with, some, with prayer, with fervent prayer. Because, you know, it's amazing, you know, we could find that the church, even though they faced some intense persecution, you'd think it would silence them or that it would stop them or it would disband them. But what happened is when they faced persecution, they gathered together to pray and God blessed them and poured out their spirit and, upon him and gave them courage and boldness to continue to speak the word of God boldly. Look at this, Acts chapter 4, 31. When they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. How many of you know that God wants to touch every one of our hearts here today? That every one of us, as, as the congregation assembles, God wants to pour out His Spirit upon the church. There needs to be a continual outpouring of God's presence and His Spirit upon the church. And it happens when we devote ourselves to prayer. Now here we have this persecution as they were experiencing, but this persecution did not silence the church. In fact, God, by His Holy Spirit, moved an entire congregation with this renewed infilling, resulting in boldness and power to be a witness. How many know today is not the day and age for the church to remain silent? Come on, today is not the day and age for us to speak no more. Today's the day and the age for us as believers to pray, wait in the presence of God, God to pour out His Spirit upon us and give us boldness so that we can speak to people about Jesus. Acts chapter 12, verse number 5 is another example of the church being devoted to prayer. This is another time when they faced intense persecution. And it says this in Acts 12, 5, But Peter was therefore kept in prison. But what? What's the highlighted word? What's the highlighted word? Constant prayer. How many know the early church was a praying church? The early church was devoted to prayer. And it says, as they were in constant prayer, was offered to God for him by the church. When Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. I don't know about you. Peter is probably in the most difficult time of his life. He's been arrested for just simply being a Christian. And he has been locked up and put in chains and it's interesting, I find it interesting that here in the probably the most difficult time of his life, what is he doing? He is sleeping. I don't know about you, but if I've been arrested and I am chained and shackled 
and there are prison guards around me, probably the last thing that I am going to do is sleep. I don't know about you, but probably I would worry more. And some of us, but this is interesting what happens here. As the church, if we could put a split screen to this, and we could see a scenario of a church that is, what are they doing? They're constantly praying. They're praying for Peter. And what does Peter have? Peter has peace, doesn't he? He doesn't have to worry. You know, you may be going through some of the most difficult times in your life, but how many of you know you can have the peace of God and you can sleep in heavenly peace? How many of you know oftentimes when we are burdened with issues, the first thing that goes is our sleep. We can't sleep because our mind is consumed in fear and worry of what's going to happen. But Peter has such peace in his heart and life, he has confidence because his, hand, his life is in the hands of God. I'm thankful whether he lives... It doesn't matter or whether he dies, he knows where he is going and he can have peace with God. And so as, as the Apostle Paul said, if, my, if I am to live, my life, I am, it's gain, but if I am to die, it's also gain. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You know what, if I am here, if I, if, 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 if I choose to live, if God allows me to live, then it's good, it's, I'll be a witness for Christ, but if I die, I'm going to a much better place. It's gain. There is such peace in his heart, and he has that. And so I just want to encourage you today. Some of you may be experiencing a prison, a difficult time of some sort in your life. I'm just, I pray that the church is praying for you and that the supernatural peace of God will just come through and that God, God's got this. God's going to take care of this. And let's just trust him. Let's worship. Let's have faith in him that it's going to work out. For God works all things together for the good to them who love him are called according to his purpose. So here we have this situation where the church devoted themselves because somebody was in desperate need. Somebody was in trouble. You know what? And that, there may be somebody in trouble in your life. Let's pray for them. Come on, let's not fail to pray. Let's pray for people because it can be a sense of peace in their, bring them a, such a peace in their life. And so what happened here is, as there was somebody that was in trouble, the church gathered. You know what, that's what the church is really to be about. It's to be a place where we gather and pray. And they often prayed corporately. And, and God, it's nonetheless, hasn't changed. God intends for His people to gather together for meaningful and enduring, devoted prayer. You know what the Bible says this, as Jesus said this, Hey, my house shall be called a house of but you have made it a den of thieves. In other words, the church can become something that God didn't design it to be. Correct? The church can lose its purpose. Yeah, we, we, can, be a, we can become a marketplace, or we can be a place where God can encounter, people can encounter God's presence, where they can come in and worship, and they can experience God. That's what the house of God is to be, a place of prayer where we can come and pray and worship to God. So in Acts chapter 12, verse number uh, uh, 5 through 6 or 5 through 17, it's really, it really shows us uh, some miraculous things that happen. And I want to talk to us this morning about the focus of their prayer. Then I want to look at the force of their prayer life. And then I want to look at the flabbergastation of their prayer life. That's a fun word. It, it had an F. It was the only one I could find, okay? So number one, let's look at the focus of their prayer. And that verse number six, the focus of their prayer, and essentially I see Taylor's moving me along like Colton. Colton, you've been talking to him? I'm not quite there just yet. But here we have church, the church is praying for Peter. And what should the church be praying for? Who, or should I say who, should the church be praying for? As we look here, we can see that the church gathered to pray specifically for someone. And they gathered to pray for Peter. Now I want to suggest to you four areas this morning that should be on our prayer focus. Four areas, things that we should be praying about. And, and I think that then it could also help us as we pray about them, they'll bring peace to their life. And perhaps it'll bring deliverance from them and the strongholds that are in their life today. Number one is this, let's pray first of all for our political leaders. Now you can go. 
Let's pray for our political leaders. You know what? Politics isn't the answer to our problems. Jesus is the answer. Governance is not the answer to our problems. God is the answer to our problems. But I want us to notice here, Peter's in the situation that he's in because of politics. Look at Acts chapter 12, verse number 1 through 5. It says, now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass them from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. I find it interesting that if it's not against the law, but you can kill somebody and, and, and it'd be okay. You know, it may not be against the civil law, at that point, obviously, they felt like that. That was, you know, it, the Bible does still say, thou shalt not kill. And so it, it's interesting. It says, they killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it, that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter, Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Okay, so, so what we have here is we have this situation, right, that, that we have Herod, the king, who is trying to lead the nation and he's discovering that in order for me to please the people i'm gonna i'm gonna it it, it caused people how I many people will do whatever they can the pressure from the people will cause our pol politicians to do whatever it is that they want to need to do whether it's right or wrong they'll even compromise their own convictions because they still want to maintain that office of leadership they face the pressure they face the pressure of people to create laws that may even be contrary to what is biblical because they're wanting they're wanting to run that second term or they're wanting they're wanting that and so they feel the pressure of that and so they'll do whatever it is that they can do that will please the people I, John the Baptist though he wasn't a political leader he was a prophet the Bible says that he was not easily swayed, a, a reed that was not quickly broken or easily swayed by the wind. And he gives us this image that he didn't really care what people thought. <laughs> you know what? He, 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 is, he is a bruised reed. He'll, he'll take it. You know what? He'll take the lumps from the people, even though he doesn't, because he'll stand for God's truth and he won't compromise. And he's not a reed that's easily swayed or broken. He doesn't listen to the opinion of people, but yet he is, he is a man that says this is what is right and this is what is true. Jesus gave that commendation about John the Baptist. And so how many of you know we need some political leaders that are not afraid of what the people say? And so what's happened here is there has been a persecution that has come to the church because of leaders. And so we see here, and I would just in encourage you, I think really, I don't want to say that this is a prophetic word, but I'm telling you what, in this day and age, we're by and large a Christian nation, but I'm telling you what, these, this Christian nation is, falling, is, is, is going down and less and less and less. And what's going to happen is Christian people, though we stand up for righteousness, is going to be attacked. And if you stand up and you say that this is wrong, then you're going to be a bigot. You're going to be hated. And so what, what has to happen is, is saying this, you know, we need to really pray for the political leaders of our, our nation. We need to really pray for them because the pressure of the people or the pressure that they're going to experience uh, they want to be popular and they want to maintain this area of authority. Now, the Apostle Paul gives us a charge to pray for our political leaders. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Paul says this, and he tells the church, he says, Church, listen, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. I mean, you know, everybody deserves to be prayed for. There should be no prejudice in our praying, isn't it right? I, everybody needs a prayer. Everybody needs God. And so we should all be praying for all people. But then he, he, then he specifically narrows it down and he says, but then for kings and all who are in authority, 
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, so this is a prayer that he's saying, hey guys, while you're praying, don't forget just to pray about yourself. Let's pray for others. And the others that you need to be praying for is all men, but more specifically, you need to be praying for those who are kings and all who are in authority. There, there should be people that run our civil government uh, with, uh, with, who administrator it properly and they lead it uh, correctly. And he is saying, let's pray for all of them. And he mentions here even the bad ones. He didn't say the bad ones, but he says all of them. But you know, some of them are going to be bad. So he says, let's pray for all of them. So those who are in authority, those who are in political leaders, let's pray for all of them, good or bad. And he says, what are we supposed to do for them? And he says, we're supposed to pray for them. And he, he exhorts us, encourages us to do the following. He says, let's... Let's make supplications, prayers, intercession, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, he doesn't tell us what to pray, but he does tell us types of prayer. And he says, let's make supplications. Let's ask God. Let's, let's, let's make prayers, a general term that we're talking to God. Let's make intercessions, which means that we're praying on some, for someone else, and the giving of thanks, showing God gratitude for them. So he's saying, guys, all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. That's what he is saying to us. And he says why we need to pray for them. In this verse, he says, number one is because, first of all, we are exhorted to. He says, let's pray for them because God asks us to. And number two, we need to pray for political leaders because, secondly, they can affect the conditions that we live in. He says we may, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Leadership has the ability to influence. They have the ability to make laws, but also to set the example of moral decency and good behavior. And so they can impact our families. They can impact our churches. They can impact our workplaces, our cities, and our countries. So they can either promote righteousness or they cannot promote righteousness. So it's easier for us so that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life. I mean, come on, Daniel was a man that, that the political leaders effect, affected his religious freedom. You remember Daniel, how they changed the law that says you can't pray publicly anymore? Did it stop Daniel from praying publicly anymore? No, it says that he went down on his hands and knees right in front of the window, as was his custom, and he prayed three times a day. Because there's a higher law that he is more willing to obey than civil law. And so, folks, I'm telling you, our leadership, our government can affect, can affect our life. And it's important for us that we pray for those who are, are, are above us. Because they also have the ability to affect our religious freedom. Now, whether you, I'm not here to promote Donald Trump whatsoever. Whether you believe in him or not, listen, I know he's kind of crazy. I know that some of the things that he says are, are, are and I'm like, oh, let's, oh my goodness, just be quiet. Yeah, I understand that. But I, I know, take away all of that stuff, there's been no other president that supports our religious freedom than Donald Trump. And I'm here to tell you that our religious freedoms are under attack on the issue of abortion, on the issue of sanctity of life, on the issue of relationship between husband and wife, man and woman, male and female, on these issues. Uh, uh, you, know, you know what? In fact, uh, we're posting this on Facebook. I'll probably get some hate speech right here, but that's okay. I, I'm standing for God's Word. God's, I know what God's Word says, and we're not going to compromise on that. And so anyways, but I'm here to say we need to pray for those who are in leadership over us because they have the ability to affect our religious freedoms. Not only that, but also that people will be saved. Because if you look at the verse 4, he who desires all men to be saved and come to life. To the, how many of the enemy wants to stifle out our ability to propagate the gospel so that people won't get saved? So in a way, prayer for our political leaders is a way for us to actually help to evangelize the lost. 
We need to pray for our political leaders. Second area of prayer focus is we need to pray for our preachers. Pray for our preachers. Now notice this. This was a church leader. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to him by the church. Now, Peter was the early church leader. James had been killed. Stephen was killed just before them. And the enemy was targeting leaders. The enemy was targeting those who were on the front lines. Jesus said this in Matthew 26. He said this, Strike the shepherd, and then the sheep of the flock will scatter. In other words, let's destroy the leader, then it'll mess up the followers. So preachers and church leaders, missionaries, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they are under the hit list of the enemy. And they will be under attack because they are leading the battle on the front lines. And if the enemy can just put out any of those, then he's made a big dent. And so what the Apostle Paul does in Colossians 4, 2, and 4, he really calls the church in Colossus to pray for him and fellow preachers. So I just want to encourage you as I read this during my devotional time, and it's just really Paul is saying, hey guys, when you're praying in your prayers, by the way, pray for me. So he is not above asking people to pray for him. He's saying, pray for me. Look at this. Continue earnestly. There's that devoted, right? Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us. Know the plurality. It's not just him. Uh, but there was also other ministers that were with him. Aristarchus, Epaphras, uh, Timothy. Pray for us. He had this entourage of, of pastors that was with him. And he is saying, pray for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So we have here, it says, hey, who, who should we pray for? He's saying, don't forget to pray for us ministers. And he says, this is what, how you should be praying. Pray uh, devotedly, continually, pray earnestly, and then pray watchfully and pray thankfully. Uh, these are how you should be praying. And then he says, pray for the preachers. Why? And he says, what we should be praying for. And he says, pray for opportunities. Pray for open doors. Pray for us to find open doors uh, for the word of God. Pray for us what to speak about. Pray for us the content. What to, what to pray, what to say, and what to speak. And he says, uh, that I may speak the mystery of Christ. Give us the content. And then also help me to speak with clarity, he says, so that I may make it plain and make it simple so that people can understand it. And then also that I could pray with courage because he said, I'm also in chains. I mean, you know, Paul could have gotten discouraged, right, in his preaching. And so he's saying, pray, pray for me, for courage. And so anyways, he encourages us here to say, hey, let's not only pray for our political leaders, let's also pray for our preachers so that God will... Uh, shield them from being uh, bombarded by the enemy because the enemy wants to take them out. But let's also pray for them that they know what to say, that they have opportunity so that the gospel... Uh, the enemy doesn't want the message to go forth. The enemy doesn't want that message to go forth. And so he's going to try to do whatever he can to stop the message, to, to stop God's speak, spokesperson so that that message won't go forward. Third area of prayer focus, he says... Number, number one is political leaders, two is preachers, but thirdly, let's pray for those who are persecuted. Pray for those who are persecuted. Hebrews 13.3 says this, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourself are in the body also. Folks, I, you know what? Thank, thankful that we live in the United States of America. We don't have people, we don't have to worry about people outside of us gonna gun us, gun us down because it's against the law, right? Or because we serve, a di there's a different religion. We don't have to worry about those types of threats where we are. We, we have a different type of persecution here, uh, but I'm here to tell you guys, it's a dangerous time for Christians in America and around the world, specifically around the world. There's unprecedented persecution of Christians around the world from Mexico to Syria. 
And there are people that are being destroyed. The Bible tells us this. If you live a godly life, you will face persecution. If you live a godly life, you will face persecution. And Jesus said this, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you also. And no servant is above his master uh, because if they persecuted him, they're going to persecute you also. And so, folks, we are living in a day and a time when persecution, uh, particularly in America, is going to start increasing. And it's going to be hard. But, I, but, but might I say this? Persecution can be good in the fact that it's a last day separation from sheep and goats. How many of you know you're not going to serve God if there is a gun pointed at your head? <laughs> It'll find out who, if you're, who's real and who's not. Trouble and persecution will separate sheep and goats. And it's an end time separation that will happen. And, and so, folks, I, you have to endure persecution. You have to be able to face persecution and face it with courage. But, folks, I, I, I would think, perhaps myself included, that we are oblivious like an like a ostrich with its head in the sand to the sufferings of Christians all across this world. People that, that have lost their lives, people that have been raped or been, been kidnapped or people that have lost their heads and people that have, have denied their faith. They've, they've gone into a place and they've become a follower of Christ and they have to give up their religion to serve God. And then there is some intense persecution, folks. And the, the scripture there says that, hey, listen, remember those prisoners as if chained with them. You know, the Bible says we are part of the body of Christ. The body is bigger than Kirkland Assembly of God. And he's saying, for those who suffer, we should also suffer with them. If they rejoice, we should also rejoice with them. And this scripture verse is saying, hey, listen, there are your brothers and sisters that are overseas or even here in the United States that are suffering persecution. And, he's, and he is saying, guys, let's, we, there are brothers and sisters. They are part of our family. And he is saying, let's remember them. So Peter, like him being in prison, we have to remember those who are being persecuted. Every month, this is according to uh, uh, Open Word, I think is what it's called. Uh, open Doors watch list show that some 215 million Christians experience high, very high, or extreme persecution. Every month, over 255 Christians are killed. 104 are abducted. 180 women are raped sexually harassed or forced into marriage. 66 churches are attacked. 160 are detained without trial and in prison. And you know what? Prayer is our greatest weapon. And we need to pray for those who are in the midst of persecution. And we also, the Bible tells us, that we need to pray uh, for those who are doing the persecution. Jesus said that, didn't he? Love your enemies and pray for those who... Uh, despitefully use, use you and persecute you. But we need to pray for those and pray for the families of the loved ones of those who are being persecuted. And we need to pray that the church would rise up, that the church, the American church, would rise up and support our brothers and sisters. And we need to pray for the leaders that, would, that, would, that could help stop and help stop the fight against this persecution. Pray for persecution and fourthly, prayer focus. This morning, we need to also pray not only for our political leaders, for our preachers, and also for those who are persecuted, but fourthly, we need to pray for those who are in prison of some sort. Acts chapter 12, verse number 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the doors were keeping prison. Now, I want to talk to you that people can be bound up in two prisons. Not when I say prison physically, they may be a prison. But what I'm talking about, there are Christians perhaps that are, they have a prison of a bad situation. How many know Peter's in a bad situation? This is a bad night for him. He's in trouble, isn't he? Peter's in a bad situation. And so we need to pray for those people who are in a prison. They're in a bad situation. Their prison, it couldn't necessarily just be a prison. It could be a prison. You know, it could be a prison where uh, Peter was in prison. Jonah was in the belly of the well. How many would like some prayer if you were in the belly of a well? How many of you'd like some prayer if you had some issues, a woman with an issue of blood? There may be a, a physical prison. 
that you may be in, that you may be trapped in. There's some trouble in your life. There may be a prison. You may be bound in something. It's some type of trouble, whatever that trouble may be. Uh, maybe it's a financial trouble. Maybe you're in a, a troubled uh, financial situation or whatever, whatever this trouble may be in your life. There is trouble. I'm thankful today. I'm thankful today, folks, that in the midst of our trouble that we can cry out to God and He hears us in the midst of our trouble, Ryan. Aren't you thankful today that we can be drowning in the sorrow and the burdens of our trouble? But if Psalms 46 and 1 says He is the ever-present help in the time of of trouble and that God hears us. And so maybe, maybe people are experiencing trouble of some sort. We as the church, our focus needs to be for people that are in trouble of some sorts that God will help deliver them and be their savior in the time of trouble. But this prison also could be a prison of sin. As he was shackled and chained with these uh, uh, chains, uh, there, he was bound and there was gates that were uh, holding him captive. Uh, people are also bound in sin and they're bound in addiction and they're bound in a pornography and they're bound in lust and they are bound and the enemy has them tied. The enemy has them captivated and, and they, are, they are bound by these things. And the only thing, folks, that's going to set people free is the power that can only come through a church that prays constantly for people. Come on, somebody. God wants to set people free. God wants to liberate somebody. God wants to set the captive free. Somebody that is bound and shackled. And, and there's nothing more like being free until you know that you are free. Amen? And the Bible tells us this, whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed. And we want to pray and believe that they're not going to be bound by that thing anymore. They're not going to be controlled by that thing. The only thing that we're going to be bound by and controlled by is God. He's the stronghold. He is the one that has control of my life. He is the one that is the chain in my life. I am His prisoner. I am His slave. And I am bound to Him. And that's what Jesus wants to do. There are people that are bound in addictions of alcohol and pornography and lust and drugs and alcohol. But I'm thankful today that he has the power through the cross of Jesus Christ to break those things, to break those addictions and break those strongholds and untie them and to loosen them, the things that are holding people back. I'm thankful that the Israelites, as they were held captive by the Egyptians, that God sent them a deliverer, Moses, to set the people free. And it's the same today. Just as Moses spoke to those words of Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. The church needs to be in prayer like Moses prophetically claiming to the enemy that says, let my people people go. They are not yours. They are God's property. They belong to Him, not to the enemy. And God wants to set people free. And God has sent Jesus here to set us free from those chains of sin. Jesus, God has set Jesus here to break those addictions and those strongholds. And my friend, if you're sitting here in church and you are bound, God can break that addiction. God can break that stronghold. You may be... You may know Jesus, but yet there is still some limitation in your life. And the Lord is calling you out of those grave clothes. And you, He has called you out of those things and saying, God has set you free. He wants to give you a new life today. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to set us free. That's our prayer focus today, church. Let's stand to our feet this morning. God has called us to be a church to devote ourselves to prayer. Devote ourselves to prayer. So I have to ask this question. Are we devoted to prayer or are we devoid of prayer? Do we, do we, commit, do we believe in the power of prayer or do we, like the fishermen, pray only 15 years when I'm in trouble? So being devoted means this, that we pray often and we pray frequently and regularly. It's not infrequent and it's not hit and miss. And the early church devoted itself to prayer. They continued steadfastly in prayer. They made prayer a priority. Their early church leaders said, you know what? 
we've got to, this is our focus. Our focus is we need to continually pray and study the word. When they faced trouble and persecution, what did they do? They prayed. They went and gathered together and they prayed and God poured out his spirit upon them and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They prayed constantly for Peter while he was in prison. And this morning, I just want to encourage you that the focus of our prayer, devoted prayer, focus of our devoted prayer in Acts chapter 12 is to be, let's pray for political leaders of our nation. Let's pray for those. You know what? Uh, there is such high security for us to even get into the White House. In fact, you know, I'd be arrested if I would try to get into the White House. But you know what? How I many you know I can approach the throne of grace greater than I can approach the White House? In fact, if I want to influence the White House, I go to the throne of grace and I can reach the White House because prayer can reach into the White House. I need to affect it by praying for our political leaders because Herod's have the ability to affect and influence our lives and affect our religious freedoms. I need to pray, secondly, for preachers. They are on the front line, and the enemy has has targeted them. And if he can destroy them, then he can destroy some of the work of God. I need to pray for those who are persecuted, those who are, because of their faith, And because of the dangerous times that they're living in, have not abandoned their faith, but have stood for Christ. And they're all around this world. We need to be aware of the persecuted church and to pray for them because they are our brothers and they are our sisters. I need to pray, fourthly, for those who are in prison of some sort. A prison can be twofold. One, it could be a difficult, troubled time. Like Peter, you're in jail, and it's a difficulty. You're a believer. You're serving the Lord, but yet there's just a trial. You've you've been arrested, and there's a trial that you're going through. God can give you peace in the midst of your trouble. You can rest assured that God is with you, supernaturally with you today. Aren't you thankful today for the peace of God? Why don't you lift up your hands to Him? And if you're going through a troubled time, I want you to right now to trust in the sovereignty of God, that God is over. He's still on the throne, that God still knows where you're at, that God knows where you are. He is appointed and he is, apl- he, is a, he is ordained. Listen, you trust him. Even though you don't see him, even though you don't see and things look troubling, you trust in the Lord because God says, I'll work all things together for the good to them who love him and called according to his purpose. You trust him. You rejoice in him. You have faith in him. You don't let the devil steal your worship. Don't let the devil steal your joy. You worship him in the midst of this. If you're a believer, that's in a jail right now you just you just worship the Lord be like uh, Paul and Silas that at the midnight hour they began to lift up their songs of hymns to him and God came through and delivered them and rescued them today if you're troubled today lift your hands in prayer but also perhaps fourthly is that in that prison there also may be prisons of sin that are in our lives that sin has grasped our heart sin has come and, and we, it has shackled us, and it has bound us, and we are in chains. Today, Jesus wants to set you free from those chains of sin. Sin will no longer have control over your life if you repent of it, and you turn from him, and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, maybe there are some things that you need to repent of this morning to free yourself from that. To, I believe this, that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins today. Let's lift up our hands to him in prayer today. Father, 